just before I to read this. Um, as a church historian, which I never knew what that role really meant, uh, when I was a child, I remember going to the annual meetings, and sometimes annual meetings could be a little bit um, ruckusy, uh, as Baptists will often have certain opinions. And I remember a man by the name of Frank Mackay, and Frank Mackay was a watchmaker, and there's only one other person, two other people who would remember that name, um, was a watchmaker. And he was a Second World War veteran, because I remember in his watch shop, he also had his whole string of military medals. But one of those times in which there was this ruckusy discussion, he as a quiet person uh, definitively stood up and said, what do we believe? And he called upon and essentially said uh, the, the Apostles' Creed. And so I'm sort of I'm sort of liking Jeff coming back to and back to and back to uh, the fundamental core of our beliefs, regardless of what denominations we've ever come from. It's, it's what we believe. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle but because I was persecuted because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is uh, was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what we what you believe. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it teaches us um, who you are and what we are to believe. And I pray, Lord God, that through your words you could firmly plant in our hearts the truth, firmly plant in our hearts what it is you want to, to teach us and what it, how it is you want us to live based on what we believe. So, Lord, I pray that you would take these weak words of mine and the powerful words of yours and use them to touch our hearts and touch our minds. And teach us something, Lord, that maybe we just had not firmly grasped before. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time It's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been continuing, as we said, our look through the Apostles' Creed. It's a summary of basic Christian beliefs that the early church felt was important to, to summarize in one creed, in one easily remembered statement. I was reading a bit about it this week, and I discovered I didn't know it was also used as a baptismal creed. If someone was being baptized, before they were baptized, they would recite the Apostles' Creed as a statement of what they believed. The creed sets the parameters for Christian belief. During the early days of the Christian church, there were many heresies, many stories being spread about Christ and who he was and what he did that weren't true. And so the early church felt it was important to put a fence around what they believed so that they could combat the heresies and the, the, the untruth that was being taught. Agreement with the creed meant that you were in agreement with the proper Christian belief in the church. Believing something outside the creed meant that the, that, that belief was outside of the Christian faith. And the first instances of the Apostles' Creed, somewhat like we have today, appeared in the third century, and it developed with some changes here and there until the eighth century and what we have today. And today we're going to look at a section with two phrases in it. One is probably the most debated phrase of the Apostles' Creed, as in whether it should it be there or not. And the second contains the phrase that's probably the most powerful phrase in the Apostles' Creed. And the first is that he descended into Hades, or hell, or descended to the dead. 
Scholars maintain that the earliest um, printings of the creed did not have this phrase in it, that it was only added later, around 650 AD. And this demonstrates to me, I think, two things as I was thinking about it this week. First of all, the creed is not scripture. It's not equal to the Bible. It's not perfect. It's not God-inspired. It's not infallible. It's not inerrant like we believe the scriptures are. It's meant to be a guide. It's a human attempt to develop a proper way of thinking about God, a proper way of thinking about Christ, about faith and Christianity. And so, consequently, this line, he descended into the, into the dead or into Hades, has been debated by scholars over the centuries. And, and some theologians over the centuries, like John Calvin, and some prominent leaders of late, like the Reformed leader John Piper, will leave this line out when they will recite the Apostles' Creed. The second thing I struck me when you think of, of situations like this where a bunch of theologians and church people will debate uh, issues that maybe we don't have a clear answer to is that sometimes the church is asking questions that, or sometimes the church is giving answers to questions that no one's asking. Sometimes the church gives answers to questions that no one's asking. And the church can embroil itself in theological debates that matter to very few people outside the walls of the church, or even beyond the people who are actually debating them. There are probably very few people in the world out there who sit there and wonder, hmm, where was Jesus between the time he died and the time he rose from the dead? I know Kaylina asked me the question a few weeks ago, but honestly, you probably wouldn't have asked me it if we weren't doing the Apostles' Creed, right? That's not something you ever thought of before, Kaylina? <laughs> no. <laughs> so it only came up because we were doing it. It's just, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but... Uh, I want to touch on it a little bit. So there are two passages that people use in Scripture to back up their belief that Jesus descended into hell after the cross. Ephesians 4, 8, and 9 is one of them, and it says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to them. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly reaches? Now, this is actually not talking about uh, the crucifixion, but it's actually talking about the incarnation. Jesus ascended into heaven, which we'll look at next week, and in order to be in the position to do that, he had to descend to earth, not necessarily not descend into the lower regions of hell or Hades. He lowers himself to the lowly parts of earth in comparison to the splendor of heaven in order to be our sacrifice, in order to be our savior. So that passage doesn't really fit in terms of backing up this phrase. The second one's a little more confusing. 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20 said, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah when the ark was being built. So some will look at this passage and say, Well, Jesus, after the cross, went to the, the lower regions, to hell, to Hades, to preach to the spirits in prison, the Old Testament people who were there awaiting the, the, the sacrifice of Christ. Wayne Grudem, a theologian, writes that he disagrees with that, saying some, this is something Jesus did at the time of Noah, that by it's spiritually, in the spiritual realms, not between the cross and the resurrection. Um, I haven't quite figured out what to do with this passage, so, but... One, uh, one commentator talks about um, the, the statements from the cross as being key and important to understanding what happened to Jesus after the cross. First of all, he says to the thief next to him on the cross, there were three people, three crosses that day, Jesus in the middle and two thieves on either side of him because the cross was capital punishment of the day. It was how people, criminals were killed and Jesus was being treated as a criminal. And he turned, one thief turned to him and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was sorry for what he did. And he believed that Jesus was who he said he was. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise, which gives some indication as to where Jesus knew he was going to be like after his death on the cross. Then he said, it is finished. Christ's suffering and separation from the Father was completed. There was nothing else that needed to be added. He didn't have to take an extra step further to go into to the deeper regions, into hell, and do battle. And then finally he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, which gives the idea of committing my spirit to God, going to God right after his death. Wayne Grudem writes, Jesus experienced exactly what we'd experienced. His body died and was buried, but his spirit passed immediately into the presence of God. 
Now again, Martin Luther, very well-known person in church history, he disagreed a little bit, and he said, the scriptures teach that Christ, after he was made alive in his grave, descended into hell, not to suffer punishment, so he agreed with that, it wasn't to punish him, but to proclaim victory over his enemies in hell. He said it was almost like Jesus went to hell and kind of went, yay, I won, see, <laughs> I'm, I'm the victor. John Calvin, like we said, he saw Jesus Christ's descent into hell as referring to the wrath occurred on the cross. He already experienced the full wrath of God already on the cross. So that's kind of my thinking, and again, this is just my personal opinion, I guess, is hell is separation from God. We have a whole other discussion on whether it's actual flames or not. I tend to think it is. But the main point of hell is that you are separated from God forever. Um, Somebody once, I think it was C.S. Lewis, who said, um, we have the opportunity here on earth to say, the God, to, say the, to God, thy will be done. And if we don't, at the end of, the, end of time, God will say to us, thy will be done. You didn't want to be with me here. You don't have to be with me in eternity kind of thing. Hell is eternal separation from God. It's a, it's a rejection. We've rejected God, and therefore at the end of time, he rejects us. He gives us every opportunity until that time to come to him in repentance and come to him and, and, and have him invade our lives and live the life that he created us to live. But hell is eternal separation from God. And that already happened on the cross. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hard to explain how Jesus was fully God and yet God the Father forsook him. But because Jesus took on his shoulders all of our sin and all of the ugliness of our sin, God had to turn his back on his own son. So Jesus experienced hell in a sense when he became sin for us and was rejected by God the Father. So I tend to agree with John Calvin, who says that hell was God's rejection of Jesus, his wrath poured out on Jesus on the cross. So more accurately, you know, may have noticed we've been here the last few weeks, we've changed one of the, the, our recitation of the Apostles' Creed to one that is often used today in a number of churches, where it said he descended to the dead. Alistair McGrath, another theologian, says, it is the statement of the belief that Jesus really did die. In other words, Jesus shared the fate of all those who have died. The idea of Jesus sharing our human experience. So quite honestly, it's, it's a question I'm not going to lose a whole lot of sleep over. There are much more important questions in this world that the world is asking of the church. What did Jesus experience in that time between the cross and the resurrection is a mystery. The scripture gives us some clues, but it's not clearly spelled out. But what is clear is this. Jesus became sin for us on the cross, and he paid the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made righteous in his sight. And what's also clear is that Jesus didn't stay the dead. He rose from the dead to prove that everything he said and did was the truth. The resurrection was the ultimate validation of everything that Jesus taught and everything that he said and did. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. Now, there are some who will say, who will argue against the resurrection, people who have a hard time with miracles or, or just think, well, this can't happen, so they argue against it. But the major proof is the empty tomb. Jesus' body was never found. The tomb was empty. Now, some people... And it's spelled out in that book, The Case for Christ, I was showing you. Some people have different arguments about that. They'll say, well, the, the Jewish religious leaders, they stole the body. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because as we saw last week, they wanted the Jesus problem gone. They had enough of him, um, you know, fla flaunting, the, floating against the Jewish religious rules. They wanted him out of here. And if he rose from the dead, and that just got all his followers worked up again, that's the last thing they would have wanted. Some people say, well, well, the Romans, the Romans stole the body. Well, like we said last week, Pontius Pilate, he wanted peace and order. He wanted just everything, don't rock the boat. And nothing would have rocked the boat more to this sect of Christians is if, you know, that they believed that the, the Messiah had risen. They wanted the Jesus problem gone too. Some will say, well, the disciples stole the body. They engaged in this elaborate, deliberate fraud to create their own religion and to, to say, well, in order to prove that Jesus was who he said he was, we're going to steal the body so people will believe that, that he did rise from the dead. But the issue here is that 
after Judas was, was gone, there were 11 disciples left. Ten of the 11 disciples died a martyr's death. Ten of the 11 disciples died to their death believing that Jesus rose from the dead. Only John died of old age. Who would die for something that you know is false? You might die for something that somebody might string you along a line and you believe it and you put your trust in that leader and you may end up going to your death believing it. But if you were the executor of that fraud, if you put it in place, don't you think when it came time to be executed for your faith, you would go, hey, just a minute, wait a minute, just kidding, JK, it wasn't, wasn't true. You know, don't you think that would have happened? But all 10 of them went to their death knowing that Christ had risen from the dead. Some people will argue what they call the swoon theory, that Jesus didn't really die, he just fainted. He just kind of um, went into unconsciousness and they put him in the tomb and a couple days in the tomb, he got some rest and kind of woke up and rolled away the big heavy stone and, and walked through. You, you can tell by my sarcasm that I don't quite buy it. <laughs> He was beaten within an inch of his life. He received 39 lashes, the maximum 40, you know, and then these lashes with this whip with little pieces of stone in it so that when they whipped, it tore out pieces of his flesh. I don't know if you've seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, which graphically exhibits what Jesus went through. Did you see it, Katrina? She's nodding and it's kind of like, it was graphic, right? You know what? There's about seven seconds of that movie, Katrina, that I've never seen because I know it's coming and I close my eyes. <laughs> yeah, you too? Um, especially the part where he's being whipped and there's a scene where he graphically shows the, the flesh that's coming off when the whip is brought away from his back. And I know that's coming and I'm like, okay, I'll be back in a few seconds here. I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't watch. He was beaten within an inch of his life. A spear was thrust into his side on the cross and blood and water came forward, which meant he had lost almost all of his blood. The Roman centurions who killed him on the cross, they were professional killers. This was their job, to kill criminals on the cross. And they made sure that these people were dead. They knew how to do it because if they failed in their job, their bosses in Rome were not very nice people and they would be killed if they didn't do their job right. So they knew that the person they took from the cross was dead. And even if it was true that he only swooned or lost consciousness, what would have emerged from the tomb would have been a very weak um, man in need of urgent medical care. But instead, what the disciples saw and believed that came from the tomb was a man of power, a man who was totally restored, save for the scars in his hands and his feet. The scripture passage we read said that many witnesses saw him, up to 500 people at one time. In the case for Christ, he talks about talks to somebody who's, who's an expert in, can people have hallucinations? And is it possible for 500 people to all hallucinate the same thing at one time? And she's like, no, it's not possible. Uh, 500 people witnessed the resurrection of Jesus at one time. And, and like Paul says in Corinthians, many of them were still alive at the time when the Gospels and Paul's letters were written. So they could have come up and said, hey, wait a minute, but your writing's not true. But the biggest proof of the resurrection of, of Christ was the transformation of the disciples. And Lee Strobel writes in um, one of his books, quoting a philosopher named J.P. Moreland, and he writes this. When Jesus was crucified, his followers were discouraged and depressed. So they dispersed. The Jesus movement was all but stopped in its tracks. Then after a short period of time, we see them abandoning their occupations, regathering and committing themselves to spreading a very specific message, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of God who died on a cross, returned to life, and was seen alive by them. And they were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming this without any payoff from a human point of view. They faced a life of hardship, they often went without food, slept exposed to the elements, were ridiculed, beaten, imprisoned, and finally most of them were executed in torturous ways. For what? For good intentions? No, because they were convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that they had seen Jesus rise from the dead. George Ladd writes that there is no adequate explanation to account for the rise of this resurrection faith in these disciples except this, that Jesus actually rose from the dead, and they saw it. So the evidence points to Jesus' resurrection. 
But what does this mean to me today in 2018? Well, first of all, it affirms our faith in Jesus. Like we said, it, it affirms that Jesus is who he said he was. Millard Erickson, the theologian, writes, The resurrection of Jesus means this, that God gave his approval to the claims of Jesus, and that these claims, which would be blasphemous, unless Jesus really was the Son of Man, are true. George Ladd writes, Jesus' resurrection is the event that validates everything that came before. We can believe and trust in everything that Jesus said and did because of his resurrection. He really is the Son of God. Secondly, we know that in Jesus, both spiritual death and physical death have been defeated. Erickson writes, the resurrection is particularly significant for inflicting death was the worst thing that sin and the powers of sin could do to Christ. In the inability of death to hold him is symbolized the totality of his victory. What can the forces of evil do if someone whom they have killed does not stay dead? Through his resurrection, Jesus has won the victory over sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15, a little bit further on from the passage we read. 1 Corinthians 15, I forgot the market, sorry. Starting at verse 54 says, when the perishable have been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have victory over sin and death. Um, I was talking to Graham before about the bees. My grandfather was a beekeeper, and uh, he died in 2000, and I did his eulogy. And I talked about this passage, about the sting of death, and I compared it to bee stings. And people in, my, in our family, we all had a different reaction to the sting of the bees. My sister, when she was about 10 or 11, had really long hair, like almost to, to the, back, the bottom of her back. And uh, one day, she, you know, because my, my grandfather kept the bees in the hives about 500 meters from the house up in the field, but where the extraction of the honey took place was in a shed in the backyard of their farm, like not far from the house. So there were always bees kind of buzzing around. And so as kids, we'd play in the backyard, and, and once in a while, a bee would come buzzing around. So one day, a bee got caught in my sister's long hair and stung her right in the top of the head where there's no flesh to... And she absolutely freaked and screamed and, and just panicked. And my grandmother came and did what she needed to do to get the stinger out and treat it. But from that point forward, my sister was petrified. She would not, she would be outside as little as possible during bee season and just was petrified of the sting of the bee. Myself, I used, when I was a kid, I was 12, 13, 14, I would go and help my grandfather. I'd go out for about a week and stay at their place, and I would work in the extraction shed. And I would, uh, I would take care of this, this big, big barrel, and you'd put the hives, the, the frames inside the barrel, and, and you'd spin it. And through centrifugal force, they would push all the honey out. And this was way back in the day when he didn't have anything mechanized, so I had to, I had to turn the crank as fast as I could that my 12-year-old arms could do it in order to get enough centrifugal force to, to, to smush the honey out of, the, of the, the frames and the hives. And even though my grandfather would, would, and my uncles would smoke the bees out of the hives as much as possible, there would still be hives, bees who would follow their hives from the the field, like 500 meters from the house to the shed where we extracted the honey. And I just imagine these bees kind of going, hey, where are you going with my home? Come back here. And so they would follow the hives to the extraction shed. So there are always about 50 bees in the shed kind of buzzing around. Normally, if on a sunny day, they would gather by the window where the sunlight was, but they would always be buzzing around. And I remember one, one time, one flew inside my glasses and started buzzing around. It, it felt like it was there for like 30 seconds. It was only there for a second or two, and I managed to shake it out before it bit me. But the constant buzz of the bees and the constant feeling that, oh, I could get stung, even though I enjoyed working with my grandfather and my uncles, and I really enjoyed the work, and I enjoyed especially when they would open the, the tap for the honey, and I'd stick my finger in it and eat honey, get the proceeds from my hard work, I was always tense. I was always nervous. And I could spend about maybe an hour, an hour and a half working in the shed, and then I'd have to go, excuse me a minute, and I'd have to go outside and just kind of go, <sighs> okay, <laughs> I need to relax, get away from the, the sound of the buzz, and then I can go back into it. I was always, 
I wasn't petrified of this thing, but I was nervous and I was, I was tense about it. Then there's my grandfather. I remember watching him. He was working the hot knife one time, taking the outer wax off the frames before we extracted the honey. And he just kind of went like that. And he kind of went like that. And then he kept going and he got stung. <laughs> so the bee stung him on the finger and he just acted as if it was a mosquito bite. He told me one time he dealt with a very aggressive swarm that bit him 50 times. He was so accustomed to this thing, he was so accustomed to it that he didn't fear it anymore. It just, it wasn't a big deal to him. He just, if he got stung, he got stung. It just, the sting didn't keep him away from doing his work. He wasn't petrified, he wasn't nervous or tense, he just, just did it. And in the resurrection of Christ, the sting of death for us is gone. There's some people in this world who are petrified of death, absolutely petrified, and, and they just don't know what's on the other side, and they, they, they're petrified, like my sister, right, who is petrified of the beast thing. And there are some people in this world who maybe aren't petrified, but they're nervous about it, like me, me with the beast thing. They're like, oh, I, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen after death. I, you know, death worries me. And then there are people like my grandfather, who's just like, the sting of death is just not even on the radar. It just doesn't matter because he just, know, he just knows that everything's going to be okay. He knows how to deal with this thing. And we can deal with this thing of death by by Christ's resurrection. We know that he has defeated death. We know that he has defeated death through his resurrection. Death will hurt a bit. For some of us, it might hurt a lot. But ultimately, in Christ, it's no big deal because we know that death has been swallowed up in victory through the resurrection of the Christ. And because he lives, we too shall live. And that's the third point that I get from the resurrection of Christ that affects us today, that we have guarantee of our resurrection in the future. If we had di have died with him on the cross, if we have taken on his death as our own for the forgiveness of sins, then we will also be resurrected with him. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Philippians 3, 10 and 11 says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. If we have died with him, if we've identified ourselves with the, his death on the cross, if we say his death was my death to my sin, then we can be certain that we will also live with him and be raised with him. And fourthly and finally, we have the resurrection of power of, of Christ living in us through the Holy Spirit. Christ is alive. He's alive today by the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a guarantee of being present with Christ in the future after death, but it's a guarantee of him being present with us in living power now in this life. Romans 8.11 says, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, and the Spirit is living in you if you've accepted Christ, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, to the Spirit who lives in you. Think about that. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. Sometimes I think I sell God short. You know, we think, oh, we can never overcome that bad habit or that persistent sin, or, or we can never accomplish anything meaningful for God, or, or, you know, we could never make a difference in this world, or, or we think, you know, oh, I can never share the gospel with that person in my family or that friend, or we think, oh, that, that physical thing, that, that disease, that sickness they're going through, that I'm going through is just too much. We can never be healed physically or emotionally. But the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in us. And just as the Holy Spirit breathed life into Jesus and resurrected him, so the Spirit breathes life into us and resurrects our spirits so that he can do far more in and through us than we could even ask or possibly imagine. The resurrection of Jesus proves that Jesus is who he said he was. It proves that he can be believed and that he can be trusted with our lives. The resurrection of Jesus shows that death has been defeated. The sting is gone. Fear not. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees that if we have died with him, if we have accepted his death on the cross as payment for the penalty for our sins, and if we've died to ourselves in the sense that, that we're living for him and not for ourselves, 
then the resurrection guarantees that we will be raised with Jesus and live eternally with him. And the resurrection of Jesus impacts our lives now, in the present, moment to moment. For the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And by that spirit, God wants to live in us and through us in resurrection power. He wants to work in us to breathe true living life in us, to make us more like Christ, to make us into the person that he created us to be. He wants to work through us to bring life to others, bring life to those around us we know who have allowed themselves to become spiritually dead. Let's not sell God short. Jesus is alive. And his resurrection power is living in us. If we really understood that fact and lived accordingly, how would our lives be different? What would change? Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, what would change if we really, really believed that Christ rose from the dead and the power that raised him from the dead lives in us? How would we live differently? How would we approach God differently? Because he did rise from the dead. The sting of death is gone. Sin is defeated. And he is who he said he was. And he wants to do amazing things in you and through you. Take a moment. Ask yourself those questions. Do I really believe in the resurrection power of Christ living in me? And if I did, what would my life look like? How would it be different? Take a moment. Let God speak to you. Make this personal in your life. Jesus, thank you for being willing to go to the cross to carry our sins, to pay the penalty for our sin. And thank you, Jesus, that you didn't stay dead, that you defeated death, sin, the enemy. The sting of death is gone. And we can live in a new life because your spirit lives inside of us. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us all me included, Lord, to live a life that takes your resurrection power seriously and doesn't sell you short. I pray, Lord God, that we would be able to see more evidence of your resurrection power at work in our lives. Help us, Lord, to allow it to happen. Help us, Lord, not to sell you short. Remind us every day that the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And help us to live lives that reflect that fact. Do in our lives, Lord, more than we could possibly ask or imagine, infinitely more. As we serve you and live for you and live the life that you created us to live. Thank you again, Lord for your death and resurrection. And we celebrate that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>